I built a working webhook system from scratch, but I also made a terrible mistake. My system will not scale, and in this video we're going to explore why, and also figure out a way how we can solve this to make our system scalable. So here's what my implementation looks like, and let's try to figure out what the problem is. I'm creating an order and storing it with EF core inside of my database, and then I'm using the webhook dispatcher abstraction to dispatch an order created event, which is going to send a webhook request to any subscribers. If I go into the implementation of this method, you will see that we're fetching the existing subscriptions from the database, and then iterating over them one by one, and sending a post request using our HTTP client. And all of this works fine, but there's a huge problem, and I hope you already noticed it. So back in our endpoint, we are awaiting our webhook dispatch to complete, which is also doing all of the work in the background. Now, imagine a situation where we have thousands of subscribers for a given webhook. We would grind our system to a halt, and the post endpoint for creating an order would be terribly slow. So let me start the application and show you why this is a problem. I already added a couple of subscribers to the order created event, and now I'm just going to send a request to create a new order. And you can see that this completes after a few moments. Now, if I go into my distributed traces, and I take a look at the one distributed trace that I have, which is a post request to the orders endpoint, you will see the original span, which is our API request, and five additional spans for our webhook requests. And the problem is, if we take a look at the timing info, you can see that all of these spans are part of the same overall trace. So they are actually slowing down our API response. Now, if I were to add more subscribers, let's say 50, 100, 1000, all of them would have to execute before we can return the API response. And this is a terrible design when it comes to scalability. So let's explore a possible solution. So the problem is how we are dispatching our webhook. Instead of executing everything right when we call the dispatch method, we actually want the processing to run asynchronously. So I'm going to create a record that will represent the actual operation that I want to execute. And let's call this the webhook dispatch and it's going to contain the event type, so just wrapping my arguments, and the data, which is my payload. Then I'm going to create another instance of the dispatch method, and this is actually going to be our actual dispatch method. I'm going to rename the old one to process async. So now I'm decoupling the dispatching of my event from the processing. Now you will see how we're going to execute these parts separately. I'm going to need another service, and the simplest solution I'm going to use is just a simple channel, which is like an in-memory message bus that I can use to pass messages between my components. Now the channel type is going to contain the webhook dispatch message, and let's call this the webhooks channel. So now my dispatch method is just going to say webhooks channel, writer, and write async, and we're going to pass in a new instance of the webhook dispatch method. I can also add a constraint that the object that we are passing in as our generic argument cannot be null. So now our actual webhook dispatch is going to be blazingly fast. Now, how do we handle the processing? I'm going to create another type that I will call the webhook processor, and this is just going to be a background service. So let's go ahead and implement this. This has one method, which is called execute async, and this is where our actual logic is going to live. Now inside of the background service, I will need a service scope factory so that I can create my scope service, which is the webhook dispatcher, and I'm also going to inject the channel, which I'll call the webhook channel, and this is how I'll be able to read any messages published to the channel. So now I can say await, for each, and we are accepting the webhook dispatch, and we're going to get this using our webhooks channel, access the reader property, and say read all async. Now I'm going to just review the autocomplete that I'm getting here, so it's instantiating a scope, using it to get my webhook dispatcher, and then calling the process async method. So this seems like it will work, so I'm going to accept this. So thank you Copilot for saving us some time. So now we are able to also asynchronously process our webhook dispatch messages. So let me configure this with dependency injection. So let's say right 
Here, after I add my database context, I will say builder services at hosted service, and let's specify the webhook processor. Let's also add a singleton instance of my channel, which I'm going to create by saying channel create bounded, specify the webhook dispatch message, and I can pass in the bounded channel options. And here I want to set the capacity. Let's say we accept up to 100 messages, and then we have to decide what happens when the channel is full. So I'm going to say that any publisher should wait for the messages in the channel to complete before they can dispatch another webhook. So with this in place, let's give our implementation a second try. As my resources are starting up, I'm going to send a post request to create a new order, which is going to dispatch the actual webhook. So I land in the breakpoint that I set in the dispatch async method. And here we're just going to write this to the channel. And we're going to also land on the breakpoint in the background service because all of this executes pretty quickly. So let me hit continue. The processing is going to complete in the background, but let's take a look at our distributed traces. And you're going to see that we have some interesting changes. First of all, the span for creating an order is now on its own. There is no additional work that we are doing here. And then we have five additional distributed traces for the post requests to our webhook endpoint. So now you can see that they are running separately and they are not slowing down the post endpoint. Now the reason this is taking 20 seconds is because of my breakpoints. So let's go ahead and delete all of the breakpoints in our debugging session. And let's send another request to create an order. And if I go back to my distributed traces, you can see that this actually takes 15 milliseconds and then sending the webhook requests takes considerably more. So let's clean up our implementation here by moving these types into their own files. And I want to show you one more important thing that you should consider when implementing any kind of async processing. And this is having visibility into your system. So I'm going to add a new folder Let's call it open telemetry. And inside of it, I'm going to add a new class. So let me add this and let me call this the diagnostic config. I'll make this an internal and static class. And inside of it, I'm going to create an internal static read only instance of an activity source. Let's call this the source. And we're going to initialize our activity source with the name of webhooks API. So now I have my activity source and I can use this to create custom activities to enhance my open telemetry tracing. So let's configure this with open telemetry. I'm going to say builder services at open telemetry and then with tracing and then we're going to provide a configure method to call the add source method on the tracer builder provider. And I'm going to say diagnostics config and just take the source name. So now this is going to export traces for my activity. Now, how do we use this? Well, let's say inside of the webhook dispatcher, which is here, I want to know when I'm dispatching a webhook. So what I can do is start an activity. So I can say using activity, and I'm going to get an activity instance by accessing my diagnostics config then I can access the activity source and I can say start activity. So let me import the using statement and we can give our activity a name. So let's say we specify the event type and then dispatch webhook. So now we're going to get an additional span that represents our webhook dispatch and it's going to be connected to the original span for processing the post request for creating an order. Now we can also take this further. So for example, I want to first add a tag to this activity. Let's call it the event type. And I'm going to pass in the event type value. And then I can use this activity to link it as the parent of the spans for processing a webhook. You'll see what this means in just a moment. But let me add another property here. I'm going to call this the parent activity ID. And I'm going to pass this to the webhook dispatch when I'm publishing it to the channel. Now I'm going to use this in my webhook processor. And when I'm actually consuming a webhook dispatch method, I can create another activity. So let's create an activity instance. Let's call it activity. And I'm going to say diagnostics config source start activity. Let's give it the name of dispatch event type process 
webhook and then I'm going to say that the activity kind is internal and I want to set the parent ID that I will get from the webhook dispatch instance. So now let me run the application again and I'll show you what happens when I send my webhooks. So I created two orders in the background and let's take a look at the distributed traces. So now we are back to having just one span for the post request for creating an order. But if I go inside, you can see that the story is a bit different this time. So we have some additional spans. Here is the post request for processing an order. Within this request, we have another span for dispatching the webhook. You can see this completes very quickly. And then as we dispatch the webhook, we immediately start to process it in a different span. So now you can see that these timelines are separated from each other and processing the webhook will not slow down the API request. So now this span here is our actual webhook processing and you can see the request that we are sending to the webhook URLs. However, even this implementation has its problems. So this is a slightly improved implementation. We are no longer slowing down our original API request and we can figure out a way how to further scale the webhook processing. So there's obviously a problem here because we are processing the webhooks one by one. And we obviously run into an issue when we have a lot of webhooks. So we have to figure out a way how to scale this further. So there are a couple of options how we can solve this and we're going to explore them in our next video. If you're enjoying the webhook series, make sure to smash the like button right under this video and subscribe to my channel so that you don't miss the next video in the series. If you want to learn more about async processing, then I suggest that you watch this video next. Check out my courses to improve your software architecture skills and until next time, stay awesome.